This is One Man's Family. One Man's Family is dedicated to the mothers and fathers of the younger generation and to their bewildering offspring. Today, transcribed, we present Chapter 6, Book 72, entitled Rex Frome Invades the Barbers. Any conversation in Seacliff these days will eventually drift around to the new neighbor in the old Middleton house, two doors over from the barber family home. Rexford Frome, son of Judge Middleton's one-time gardener, has returned to the scene of a bitter boyhood, and wonderful things are being done to the long-neglected mansion. All the neighbors, save one, are watching with fascinated interest. Father Barber, after one unhappy encounter with Mr. Frome, maintains a studied indifference. Notice him now, for instance. Returning home from his afternoon walk, he moves past the Middleton place, looking neither right nor left. Once safely beyond it, he allowed his gaze to shift oceanward, where high seas are running under a gray fall sky. Inside the family home, Hazel has stopped by for a moment's chat with her mother before the cheerful open fire in the library. So I told Pinky his enlarged vocabulary would be more impressive if the new words were correctly pronounced. <laughs> <laughs> I thought I heard your voice, Hazel. Oh, hello, Father. Come in, Henry. We're having a cup of tea. Uh, well, a day out. Definitely fallish. Yeah, Hazel, my dear, how, how are you? Oh, Mother, look at the color in his cheek. <laughs> Nothing like a long walk to stir up your blood. Ah, that's a nice fire. Let the gray days go. <laughs> I, I always think this is the coziest room in San Francisco. Some tea, Henry? Thank you, my dear. Hmm, aromatic. Ooh, hot. Hmm. Uh, what are you saying about Pinky Hazel? I haven't seen the boy lately. Well, he's a busy boy, Father. First a new girl, and now he's gardening for Mr. Frome. Oh, is he indeed? Why, yes, Father. Why? Nothing, nothing. Oh, I was telling Mother about his new vocabulary. His new girl, Iris Rand, gave Pinky a battered copy of a thesaurus, and he comes up with some perfectly astonishing words like metamorphosis, only he calls it metamorphosis. <laughs> Metamorphosis. That means a, a change through a, through a wizardry, doesn't it? Very good, Father. Well, it's not a word I'd use every day. How did Pinky happen to pick it up? Oh, we were talking about the wonderful things Mr. Frome's doing to the old Middleton place. Yes, yeah, Frome. The new driveway and the painting mm. and the shrubbery. Of course, he's just pouring money into it. Dan says we could all bring about a metamorphosis if we could toss money around the way... <coughs> Why, Father... Where are you going? Uh, oh, oh, yes. Uh, pardon me, Hazel. Uh, this this wool shirt is much too warm. I'm, I'm going to change it. Uh, excuse me, if you please. Well, what's the matter with him? He just can't abide hearing about Mr. Frome. Well, surely not just because Mr. Frome's father was once the gardener at Middleton's. But well, we think it's wonderful that he could come back and buy the old place and do what he's done. And so do I, Hazel. Henry resents the fact that he's changed his name. Oh, you know your father. If the man was named Hans Froelich, he should be have stayed Hans Froelich. Well, I just stopped mentioning anything about it. Oh? Confidentially. Out of your father's hearing, I am as interested as anyone. My friend Emily Stewart is simply glued to her front window. <laughs> She says some really beautiful furnitures arrived over there, even a big grand piano. <laughs> well, if I lived across the street, I'd probably do some peeking, too. Mr. Frome's sister's coming to live with him. She's a Mrs. Christine Abbott, a widow. Hi, everybody. Oh, Jack. Hello, Jack. Oh, hello, Hazel. Hi, Mom. Come in and have some tea. No, thanks. Aren't you home early from the office? Yeah. I gotta go to a bar association dinner, and I can't find my black tie. Suppose I could borrow somebody's, Cliff's or Paul's or Dad's, just any old black tie. Aren't you feeling well, Jack? Oh, sure. Well, you look tired, dear. Oh, all young lawyers look tired. The only time a lawyer begins to look healthy and rested is when he's been appointed to a lifetime job on the federal bench. Uh, did I hear someone just come in? Well, well, Jack, glad to see you, my boy. Hi, Dan. Yes, yes, family gathering around the fireside. Uh, that's what I like to see. One of them has to go, I'm sorry. Oh, no. Sorry, Father. Dan has to have an early dinner tonight because he's going to a meeting. Meeting? I have never seen anything like it, the way this country has taken to go to meetings. Well, what in the world do people do at these meetings? They vote to increase the annual dues. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> 
I've got to go to a meeting myself, Dad. That's why I'm here. I've got to Pardon borrow... Pardon me, a... Jack. I've really got to go. Thanks for the tea, Mother. Bye, Father. Goodbye, my dear. Jack. Oh, bye, Hazel. Cheer up. It's rarely as bad as it seems. Hmm? Oh, I'm okay. Uh, Father, if you hear anything about a $5 tip Pinky got for gardening over at Fru... What, what's this? You haven't heard about it? Well, never mind. It isn't important because we made him take it back. Well, I should think so. A $5 tip. Well, goodbye. Goodbye. Goodbye, my dear. Yes, yes. I tell you, that man's a nuisance in this neighborhood. Now, Dad. Don't now dad me. I tell you, this fellow has interfered with the even tenor of our ways. He's sneering at us. And most of you haven't the good sense to see it. Well, you've heard about the thousand-dollar wristwatch he gave Joe, didn't you? Well, he knew we'd make her take it back. It's to humiliate us. He's avenging some fancied wrongs from his boyhood. <laughs> Why, I don't even remember the boy when he was, was a lad. And his old father, the gardener, but I can hardly recall him either. Yes. If in the past, sometimes, I slighted that old gardener, I'm sorry, but I didn't know I was slighting him, but there was hardly any understanding him. He was an immigrant, you know, Jack. He had the thickest German accent. It was Austrian, Henry. They speak German in Austria, Fanny. It was a German accent. And sometimes people like that suffer under fancied slights, and it drives them and eats at them all their lives, fills their hearts with hate and envy. And... Henry, now don't get all worked up. All I'm saying is I myself began as a $10 a week bank clerk, so why young Frome should make such a difference between his status and mine? Uh, Dan. Why, I simply say... Dan. Huh? Could I borrow a black tie? Tie? I'll get you one, Jack. Your father would know where to look anyway. Thanks, Mom, but I'll get it if you'll... No, no, I know right where it is. No man of any taste or discretion or judgment would make extravagant presents the way this man from is doing. Huh? You, you, you have to borrow a necktie, Jack? Yeah. Well, don't tell me you've run out of neckties at your house. I've run out of black ones. Yeah, well, what happens to your things? The well, last time I saw my black tie, Sharon Ann had made a wreath of it for a doll's funeral. Oh, 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 oh. oh she, she's a cute one these days. Uh-huh. You have six mighty attractive little girls, Jack. I stopped in early yesterday. <laughs> Queer how they twist themselves around your heart, eh? By George, the triplets are cuter every time I see them. Yeah, they're cute. Twenty-four hours a day. Here, here, here. You sound tired, my boy. What's the matter? Aren't things going well at the office? Oh, sure. Just that I don't see how I'm ever going to do any of the things I planned on doing, Dad. That's all. <laughs> Remember the sailing boat I was going to build? I was going to go up around the San Juan Islands and live on my boat. If I ever get around to doing that, I'll be too old to pull up a sail or handle a rudder. Now, now, Jack, every man gives up some of his boyhood dreams. That's part of growing up. Oh, sure, I know. I realize that. These days, I guess you're lucky if you're breathing. Oh, no, no, something's happened. Tell me, you, you hired up some? You, you need a little money? No, no. Thanks just the same, Dad. No. No, I don't want to add debts to my other worries. Hmm? Huh? You know what's really wrong with me? I've got to apologize to Betty when I get home, that's all. Yeah. It wasn't her fault I couldn't find my tie. Oh, oh. Yes, yes, yes. I see, I see. I, I, I know that situation, my boy. I, I know it very well. Here you are, Jack. It's Paul's tie. But why did you go all the way upstairs to Paul's room, family? Jack would have had mine. Well, I knew Paul had several. Clifford has only one, and yours are old-fashioned. Really? Old-fashioned? Will that do, Jack? Yeah, <laughs> thanks, Mom. Thanks very much. You'll excuse me? I've got to see about dinner. Tell Betty I'll come over after a while and help Nicolette put the children to bed. Okay. Thanks for everything. Well, Dad, I run along. It's nice to have this talk with you. I don't see you alone very much. All right, boy, now, don't try to deceive me. If you've got something really worrying you, why don't you come out with it and see if I can help? What isn't much of anything, Dad? Just a series of little things. The tie was a last straw, that's all. Yes, yes. Yeah, it's just that I had one of those left-handed days downtown, you know. My car acted up coming home. And then on the way into the house, I happened to see Mr. Frome. Huh? We were talking about the high seas running out there and sailing and so forth. And he happened to mention he's building a boat. 
and he's going to sail the San Juan Islands next summer. Confound the fellow. Don't you see what he's doing, Jack? He's upsetting us one by one, all of us, Pinky and Joan and, and Claudia. Claudia has taken to going for walks around the block. Yes, drops in here twice as often as she ever used to. Well, Dad, she just lonesome because Nicky's away. No, no, no. He's intruding on all of us, everybody. Yeah, that's all I hear. Vroom, vroom, vroom. I never do have a conversation that doesn't finally get around to Rexford. Vroom. Or even Clifford. Where is Cliff today? Yeah, oh, he had to pick up Andy at the junior monitor's meeting. Uh, yes, uh, meetings. Even the little children have to go to meetings. Dad, I've got to run along. Yeah, yes, yes. Well, uh, you come again whenever you feel a little depressed, Jack. Eh? We'll cheer you up over here. Yes, yes. Well, I- I'll go to the door with you. This talk did me a lot of good, Dan. Yes. Uh, there's quite a little breeze out. Oh, Grandfather! Oh, Grandfather! Huh? Margaret, where is she? Mm, here she comes around the hedge. Well, I'll see you later, Dad. Hi there, Margaret. Hi. Jack. Your grandfather's waiting for you. Yeah, I see him. Hi, Grandfather. Looky, I brought you something. Henry, what in the world? You'll catch your death without your coat out yet. Come in the house. Hello, Grandmother. Look, Grandfather, I brought you a present. Come in the house, both of you. That wind goes through you like a knife. Oh, come in, come in. What in the world have you got there? Just wait till I unwrap it. It's something wonderful, and I made it. Well, 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 a gigantic cake. Margaret, what? what? Henry, look at the lettering on it and birds and flowers. Why, well, Margaret. Go on, read it. Huh? Read all the lettering. To Grandmother and Grandfather Barber for no reason at all except I love them. I, what's that word? Dedicate. Huh? Dedicate, Henry. Oh, oh yes, I dedicate this, my first cake. Margaret. Huh? Margaret. You didn't bake that yourself. Yes, I did, Grandfather. Practically all by myself. And that lettering. You did that lettering? Sure. I squeezed it out of sort of a gum with Monsieur Fumagalli holding my hand. Who? Monsieur Fumagalli. Fumagalli? What what kind of a name is that? It's French. Who? And who in heaven's name is Monsieur Fumagalli? He's a chef from the Cordon Bleu. From where? It's a French school of cooking. Now, where did you ever make friends with a French chef named Monsieur Fumagalli from the Cordon Bleu? Over at Mr. Frome. Uh-oh. Will you say that again? Mr. Frome. He's Mr. Frome's chef. I'm going out and finish up what I was doing in the kitchen. It's a beautiful cake, Margaret. Shall I take it along? Oh, no. Leave it here for a while, Grandmother. I just like to look at it. I don't blame you. Now, Henry, don't spoil, you know, all the pleasure. I haven't said a word, Fanny. Well, don't. It's a perfectly <laughs> astonishing cake, Mark. Margaret, would you mind telling me how this came about? Oh, Mr. Frome likes kids. He likes to have us hanging around. Oh, does he, isn't he? Oh, yes. He says people were so unkind to him when he was a boy that he's trying to return good for evil. Isn't he? And Monsieur Fumagalli likes kids, too. He's got four of them, only they're still over in Paris. Does your mother know you're spending so much time at Frome's? Well, no. That is, she always says just stay in the neighborhood, and Frome's is in the neighborhood. Gee, you ought to see that new kitchen. It's all copper with all sorts of electric things, even electric knife sharpeners. Excuse me, Margaret. Yes, Henry Barber speaking. Oh, oh, Hazel. Margaret, she's here. Oh, she's been over at Frome's. Yes. I, uh, huh? Making a cake. Yes, yes, I know. It's beginning to turn dusk, Hazel. I'll put on my coat and walk over with you. Yes, yes. Goodbye. Uh, your mother wants you to come home. I'll get my coat on. Come along, Margaret. I don't believe she wants you lingering in the homes of strangers. Well, Mr. Frome isn't a stranger, Grandfather. He's an old friend of Aunt Claudia's. He was in love with her when he was a boy. Yes, uh, and who told you that? Joan did. Oh, shall I hold your coat? I've got to thank you. And besides, Uncle Paul and Mr. Frome are very good friends. Indeed. Who says so? Henry, are you going out? I'm walking over with Margaret, Fanny. I'll be right back. All right. Wear your heavy coat. I've got it. I've got it on, Fanny. Don't you believe Uncle Paul and Mr. Frome are good friends? Come along, my dear. No, no, Margaret. There are all sorts of rumors around. Out with you. Now, watch the steps. Well, I know that one's true because Mr. Frome's coming over to your house tonight. 
Over where? Here at your house. Because Uncle Paul invited him to drop in after dinner. Oh, gosh, it is getting cold, isn't it? Margaret, this is sheer idle gossip. You mustn't believe everything you hear. Why, your Uncle Paul wouldn't do a thing like that without consulting me. Just put it out of your mind. It, oh, oh, who's that going down through my garden toward the sea wall? Well, it looks like Uncle Cliff and Aunt Claudia. I saw Aunt Claudia through the kitchen window over at Froze. She was out walking. She walks a lot since Uncle Nicky went away. I guess she's lonesome. Okay, Cliff, why don't we go down to the seawall? I haven't been down in ages. Well, if you don't mind the cold, I love it. Who, me? I'm dressed for it. Oh, swell. I kind of like a day like this. Let's go. Oh, Dad's chrysanthemums are gorgeous this year. Look at those red ones. They're not half so red as your cheeks. Mm Mm-hmm. They do have a nice burny feeling. I like to be out in the air when it's sharp. Makes me feel clean. Yeah, I know what you mean. You always know what I mean, Cliff. That's why it's so wonderful to be with you. Do you suppose being twins creates some kind of special bond? Remember when we were 14 and 15, how we used to come down here and just sit? Sometimes we wouldn't say a word for hours. We didn't have to. 14, 15. (laughs) How young can you be? (laughs) Isn't it awful? Do you suppose we're really the same people? Well, here's a spot where we used to climb up. Can I give you a boost? Sure. Okay, you ready? Yep. All right, up you go. Oh. There. Give me a hand, Cliff. It's perfect up here. Well, wait till I get a toehold on this rock. All right, okay. Up you come. (laughs) There. Look down at our bay. Oh, doesn't that look choppy and cold? Fog and dust settling in. It's going to be dark before so very long. Mm, that wind really whips around up here, doesn't it? Mm. Oh, lost and by the wind-grieved ghost. Come back again. What's that from? It's got a sad sound. It is sad. After all these years, I've been reading Thomas Wolfe. He makes you feel so lonely. Well, aren't you lonely enough with Nicky away without reading something depressing like that? I suppose... But there's a certain solace in reading about someone who's more desolate than you are, I guess. You are kind of low, aren't you, fella? Little. Is it because Nicky's all the way over there in England, or is it something else, too? I don't know, Cliff. I want to think it's all because of Nicky. But you're not sure, huh? Oh, yes, I'm sure. I'm being silly. I know all this will disappear as soon as Nicky gets home. That won't be too long to wait. Yeah, hmm. Have you seen him? Seen him? Who are you talking about? Oh, come on, Claude. This is your twin. Remember me? Look at me. There. Now say you don't know who I'm talking about. Yes, I know. That's better. You don't fool me for a minute. No, I haven't seen him to talk to. You do mean Rex Frome, naturally. Well, who else? Maybe I'm making him more important than he really is because I've just learned about your meeting with him up in Montana some of before last. And the way it upset you. But you were there. Why, you... Oh. Yes, I keep forgetting about all those years you've had blotted out. Mm, there's so much talk about this from character. Naturally, I had to be brought up to date on it. Isn't it ironic how things work out? After all these years, I finally get close to Joan... At last, I really think I've become a mother to her. Well, sure you have. And everything's going so smoothly with us. And then, wham, all the nice seams start coming apart. Nicky has to go to England because of the devaluation of the pound. And then this ghost out of the past rises up to haunt me. And that's all Rexford Frome is, Cliff, a ghost. Well, really? (laughs) All right, I believe you. I thought you were looking at me with a kind of peculiar expression. Well, I wasn't. At least I didn't mean to be peculiar. Could be just my funny face. Oh, silly. What I mean is, I don't really have any doubt about my love for Nicky. And Rexford Frome is nothing to me. Nothing. Not anymore. I know that, but... Oh, I don't know. What is it anyway? What's what? This uncertain feeling I have... Is it that I don't trust myself? Is it that I must always carry with me a lost feeling? A sense that life isn't quite right? Oh, Claude, I think most of it's just because you haven't got Nicky here. 
That's what I wanted you to say. Oh, look. A boat just going under Golden Gate Bridge. Where to, I wonder? Yeah, where and why? Hey, did it just suddenly get darker or haven't I been noticing? Look up. The high fog from the ocean's coming in over us. Yeah, I'll be rolling down on us any minute. Uh Uh-oh. Look at all the lights coming on down the city. Beautiful. Dear old San Francisco. Does it seem like a person to you sometimes and not like a city at all? Well, yeah, kind of. Hey, what's going on up there? Oh, Paul. When did you come down through the garden? Hiya, fella. We were just admiring the view. You want to come up? Oh, thanks. Aren't you about frozen? Well, now that you mention it, my feet are beginning to feel a little icy. Shall we get down, Cliff? Yeah, okay. Watch out, Paul. Here I come. Hey, you shouldn't be jumping like that. Did it hurt you? No. Come on, Claude. We'll catch you. Throw it down, baby. You get that side, Paul. Okay. Well, what are you waiting for? You sure you won't drop me? There's a trusting sister for you. Come on and we'll pull you down. Oh, Cliff, let go of my leg. I'll jump. Here I come. Hey, have you been gaining lately? What is it, Cliff? Oh, a fine thing. I don't weigh a pound more than I did when I was 18, and you know it. Well, then my catching is getting rusty. It's all right, Claude. It's only kidding. You fell into our arms like a zephyr. Well, that's better. Oh, say, I've got to get home. It's late. Oh, why don't you stay and have dinner with us? Mrs. McCullough will look after Penny and Joan. Oh, I couldn't. Joan's expecting me home for dinner, and I couldn't disappoint her. Well, let's get up to the house. This breeze is biting right into my marrow. How'd you happen to pick a day like this to go down to the seawall anyway? Oh, we were talking about things and stuff. Besides, we're tougher than you are. Yeah, but you're not older. I got you there, kid. <laughs> <laughs> you know, sometimes I forget what kind of brothers I have. Oh, honestly, you don't know how much this has done for me. Hey, I tell you, why don't you both come over to my house after dinner and we can talk? Well... Joan would love to see you. Well, I wish I could, Claude, but I've got a date. Oh? Me too. I'm taking Roberta to a late movie. Claude, well, here we are. Why don't you come in the house and get warm, Claude? No, I think I'd better run along. Well, I'll drive you home. No, please. I'd rather walk. It's only six blocks. It'll warm me up. I'm sorry about tonight. We'll do it some other time, huh? Yeah, I am too. Oh, forget it. After all, it was pretty short notice. You taking Nicolette out, Paul? Or am I being personal? Of course not. No, I see Rex Frome wanted to come over and look at my books and... Well, I couldn't see any harm in it, so... He's dropping in around eight or so. Oh. Well, I won't keep you standing here in the cold. I hope you both have a wonderful time. Well, wait a minute. We'll walk home with you. Sure. Oh, that's silly. It's almost time for your dinner. Bye. 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 Gosh, I wish we could go over tonight. She seemed kind of lonely, didn't she? Yeah. I could kick myself for bringing up Frome's name. Oh, I wouldn't worry about that. She doesn't need any reminders to think about that guy. Huh? Here you are getting palsy walsy with him. I wish you'd stayed in Montana where he belongs. Along about 8 o'clock, Cliff came downstairs to say goodnight on his way out for his date with Roberta. Well, Dad, I hate to leave this nice warm fire, but I've got to get ready to go out. I'm taking Roberta to a movie. Yes, yes. What time is it? Oh, a little after 8. Roberta was tied up the early part of the evening. We're going to catch the second show. Yeah, nobody wants to stay home anymore. Your mother over at Jack's, now you're going out. Paul's up the top of the house. He isn't going out. He's got a caller coming. Huh? Rex Frome. Didn't you know he was coming over tonight? That is true. What? What do you mean? Why, well, Margaret told me this afternoon that this, this fellow was coming here, but I thought it was idle prattle. I might have known, however, that when a man of his nature wants something, by fair means or foul... Oh, now, wait a minute, Dad. I think Paul asked him... And has Paul gone completely out of his head? Can't he see that he's an adventurer, an opportunist? Don't ask me. I don't know anything about him. I've hardly had the chance to say hello to him. Yeah, that's more than he'll get from me. That fellow needs a piece of my mind, and I intend to see that he gets it. Well, for gosh sakes, Dad, don't do it tonight. After all, he's an invited guest. Did I say anything about tonight? But I should like to make it abundantly clear to him that by entering my house, he is putting great strain on my reserve of self-control. Oh, hey, that must be him now. I'll run up and get Paul. Oh, you want a duck and have me answer the door? I shall answer it myself, Clifford. You go tell Paul to get down here and attend to his guest. Okay. I'll have him down here on the double quick. Yes, yes. Listen to that imperious ring. Ought to let him cool his heels soon, would well, how are you, Bob? Oh, it's you, Mr. Barber. Won't you come in? 
Oh, thank you. I was expecting you. Paul will be right down. May I take your coat? Oh, thank you. Rather a raw night out. If you step right in here, you can warm yourself by the fire. Say, I haven't seen this room since I was a little boy. And then I only got a glimpse of it. It wasn't exactly what you'd call a playmate of the younger barbers. Won't you sit down? Oh, thank you, yes. It really is a lovely old house. Our things are not new, but we cherish them. We've owned our home in this neighborhood for many, many years now. When one has been established in the place and grown accustomed to its ways, he doesn't take kindly to change. Yes, I think I see what you mean. Oh, my apologies. Oh, quite all right. How are you, Baba? Oh, I'm sorry as the devil I wasn't down here when you arrived. I'm glad to see you from. Sit down, sit down. Yes, yes, I hope you'll excuse me. Are you going to run off, Dad? No, I'm not running off, Paul. I'm going to my room. To be specific, I'm going to retire. Good night. Uh, good night, sir. Good night, Dad. When your mother comes in, you might tell her that I've gone to bed. She's over at Jack's house. Well, I wouldn't be likely to tell her that you've taken off for the Orient, Dad. Yes, sir. Take a look at that back. Stiff as a ramrod. <laughs> when he gets on that dignity streak, I feel like doing something low and unspeakable to jar him out of it. Has he been giving you a rough time? Oh, as a matter of fact, I rather enjoyed his performance. He did make it quite clear, however, that he couldn't have been more unhappy if he'd found something dead and partly eaten in the front hall of these sacred precincts. Well, I warned you what to expect. To be honest, I stayed upstairs deliberately hoping he'd have to meet you. Oh, oh sadistic, huh? Well, not exactly, but I thought you were going to have to run into this sooner or late, and you might as well meet it head on right at the beginning. So you'd know what you're up against around here. Don't think it'd be very fair to try to gloss over the situation, do you? No, no, I don't. I feel very pleased with myself that I'm able to take snubs now. He didn't hurt me. I felt rather sorry for him, actually. I know. It isn't that he's malicious, really. It's, uh... Well, Dad represents an era and a set of values that I've never been able to sympathize with, but they're his own, and who am I to say he's wrong, much as I might think so. I get awful mad at him sometimes, though, and vice versa. Uh, wouldn't you like a smoke? Dare I? Well, <laughs> we're not that stuffy. You want a cigar? There are cigarettes right there on the table by you. Fine, I'll have one of those. Oh, now, yeah, here, I have a light. Oh, Bob, will you stop fussing over me? You're making me more uncomfortable than the old man. Oh. <laughs> I see what you mean. Okay, from now on, you're on your own. That's fine, just relax. Good. I may even take off my shoes before the evening's over. You know, Bob, I, I like you more every time I see you. At first glance, you give the impression that you're a stuffed shirt. <laughs> Maybe I've already said this to you. Well, go ahead. You're embarrassing me a bit, but I feel a compliment coming on. I'd be an awful liar if I said I didn't like it. Have you ever lied? Certainly, lots of times. I think anybody's a fool who won't lie occasionally. I don't hold with these. Always speak the truth, no matter how much it hurts people. I don't mean that a person should lie to defraud or to gain an unjust advantage or any of that sort of thing. Well, what do you mean, then? Isn't lying lying? All right, well, I'll give you an example. Uh, my mother's getting so she repeats herself quite a bit now. Huh? Sometimes she'll be telling me something she thinks is very interesting, and she'll stop and say, Have I told you this before? I always lie. I want her to have the joy of telling me. Why should I make her self-conscious and hesitant about telling me what she feels she wants to say? A white lie will keep her a little happier than I'm going to lie. She's been made happier and nobody's been hurt. Yes, and I think then the distinction is you can lie if it'll help somebody. If it hurts somebody, you can't. Ah, that's about it, I think, yeah. You know, my sister's going to enjoy talking to you. She's got a good mind. She'll be here tomorrow, by the way. Oh? Well, I... Didn't know she was arriving that soon. <laughs> well, what's so funny? I just thought of something that tickled my funny bone, Paul. I... Yeah, did I call you Paul? Yeah, I think you did, Rex. Oh, thanks. Shall we keep it that way? Oh, why not? Good. And now that we're on a first-name basis, uh, are you going to tell me or? Little private joke. Oh, it wasn't a joke. It was a fantasy. A whimsy. Oh.